is Tommy Allen from TommyAllenMusic.com. Welcome. This week we have Mr. Robin Beebe, an old friend of mine. It was great to catch up with him in his home. He's a blues rock guitar player based in London with his band, the Robin Beebe Band. Let's check it out. So we'll jump straight in. So what does music mean to you? Oh, for heaven's sake, Tommy, what a question. Yeah. It's my life. I know it's your life, man. But what does it actually mean? Come on, is it? Oh, man, life! <laughs> <laughs> life is built around music. It always has been for since I was, um, oh, my God, since I first heard the beat. No, since I first heard Hank Marvin twang his friend a Stratocaster. About four years old. And I was, and you know what? My, my next door neighbour... Um, was about 10 years old, he was about 15, and I was only about four. And he had a band, I could hear him playing, rehearsing in his band, and they played all the Shadows music, you know, down, 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 down. And I thought, wow, wow, wow. And then, and then I loved the Beatles when I was a little boy as well, you know. And then when I got a little bit older, it was Jimi Hendrix and the, all the Eric Claps and all that stuff. And then I started, that's when I started to try to play. Right, okay. With, with with limited success, but I, eventually. So where eventually. Was, where was you born? Uh, Chiswick, mate. Chiswick. Chiswick, Charlotte's Maternity Hospital, which is no longer there. And uh, you say you started around, well, what I found, you started around 10, was it, on the guitar, dabbling? No, well, I, 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 not really, no. I was, I was properly, uh, I was more like 14, 15, actually. I mean, I got a guitar when I was 10, but I didn't know what to do with it. So I did. I used to um, clobber my sister over the head with it. No, I didn't really. Not really. Sorry. <laughs> Eventually, all the strings fell off. Um, three strings left it, and then about four years, it was like a three-quarter size proper acoustic guitar, you know. And then about four years later, I managed to work out how to play a twelve-bar blues on it, but only the in the E and the A. I couldn't do the B because it was too difficult. And somehow or other, the strings were still in tune. Right. I don't know. How they were still in tune. So, yeah, that was when I was about 14, 15. And I got a band together straight away with my schoolmates. So, let's go back still. Um, how, is your sister older or younger? She's younger. Younger. And so where was the music influence at that time? For, is your parents? Uh, yeah. I mean, mum and dad were, they were not involved. Mum used to sing. My uncle you, you, was a jazz musician and he had a, a dance band. and He played the saxophone and he also played the piano. But he was... Um, he wasn't a pro. He was a semi-pro. And she, his sister was my mum. She used to get up and sing occasionally with them. You know, she had a beautiful voice, but she never really did anything with it. But both my mum and dad were big music lovers, but they never actually participated. And they didn't really approve. They didn't really want me to be a musician because they thought it was a bit of a dodgy thing to do, you know. Right, so, okay. unfortunately, when I, when I decided to embark on a musical career, it didn't go down very well. No. <laughs> so what year... When you know, without sort of giving ages away, was what year right. roughly was this before the sixties? No, 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 no. Oh no, it was. I didn't start playing till I started playing in nineteen seventy. What when? Uh, when no, but I mean when you were sort of fourteen. Little boy, uh, yeah, fourteen. I was just nineteen seventy one, seventy that sort of time. Okay, okay. So, yeah. as you know, so that's coming out of the sort of blues era and the sort of. Yeah, it was. It was. I. I got. I got the tail end of. Um. I mean, I really got into the old. Um. The, when you say the blues era, like the British blues, the Fleetwood Mac. I. I never got the blues breakers until a few years later because, I just wasn't really. You know, I just used to listen to. I love music. But I used to listen to pop music on the radio. You know, but what 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 got me going really was like Jimi Hendrix, All on the Watchtower, all that sort of stuff. You know, and that was the late. That was like sixty eight, sixty nine. Electric Ladyland. Yeah. It was like my mates were all kind of like we were all getting into it and we were all getting um, it was like, who's the best guitarist? Is it Clapton or is it Hendrix and all that rubbish, you know? Mm. Uh, and but that was when, you know, that's what 13, 14 year olds do, you know. Yeah. So what about Peter Green? Well, I love Peter. Green. You know, the first riff I ever learned to play was Oh Well. And that but that was maybe two a year or two later, you know, when I actually started trying to play. And I was very pleased with myself because I figured out approximately how to play that. Um, and probably because of the lack of strings of the guitar. And, but eventually I did get a six, a proper electric six string. Um, I got a second hand one from a, from a junction. Okay. Uh, luckily I managed to. And then I had a mate who told me 
to understring it because it had heavy strings on. And um, I mean, the sort of strings I'd probably quite like now. But in those days, what we did, we, we took the sixth string off completely and put the fifth string on the sixth string and just shoot everything up one string. <laughs> got, a, uh, got a banjo string and put that on the first string. All right, okay. And that was my first guitar. It was made by a company called Top 20, which um, was what everybody used to buy as their first guitars. Or you future. Still have it? No, and sadly I don't. Do you know I've got a guitar a bit like that, which I've lent out to a mate because his his grandson started playing the guitar. And I lent it to him, and he hasn't got it back to me yet. Okay. <laughs> so, but, did you have a backup plan from school? Like, if you weren't following music. No. No. So, what was? Did you go to school much, or was you like me? And... I did go. <laughs> I love it, mate. I did. Yeah, I did go to school, and and I and I did do my what we had in those days, O levels. Um, I didn't do very well though because I, I, I was playing the guitar too much and just being too much of a of, of a of a of a lazy dreamer, right. a ne'er a lazy dreamer. So I did very badly. I did stay on in the sixth form, but and I didn't. But I never went to uni like like a lot of my uh, my mates did. Eventually, eventually went to uni and stuff. But I, I didn't. I just went into the University of Life after I finished school, and, and I, I pretty much became a semi pro pro musician fairly quickly after leaving school. Really, um, yeah, I had to pay a few dues. The first gig I ever got for money was um, playing in a country and western band. Um, okay. Which wasn't, which was a learning curve. It was. We, I had to play a lot of stuff I didn't like very much, actually, quite honestly. But it was just a learning curve, you know. And it's. I've always had that sort of thing where, you know, you you do stuff you don't particularly want. But it's like it, I was. I was. I was determined to be to make money and be a professional musician, you know, and any way I could. So the first thing that came up was this country and western band. So I, I had to learn how to play some country music, you know, and so I just did. Um, I wasn't all that good at it, but I got a few tips along the way, and you know, I just kind of just went went along, just went along with stuff, you know. So we're moving forward a bit there, though. No, but how, did, that, how did you get 18, into that? I was about eighteen then, something like that. How did you get into it? Was it an advert or? Well, yeah, well, we, I was in a <laughs> band with some mates of mine, and um, we um, we couldn't get we couldn't find a singer because I didn't I didn't used to sing in those days, um, so we advertised in the old Melody Maker for a singer. And this guy turns up and he sang. He's quite a good singer, he was. He was quite good. He wasn't quite our sort of, he didn't quite fit the band, but he was a good singer. And uh, he, 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 um, he sort of collared me after the rehearsal was over. He said, listen, um, I'm getting another band together. We're doing country music. Do you want to join? Because you play, you're, he said, I like your guitar playing. He said, I reckon you could learn to play country music. So I said, well, I'm not sure about that. And then he said, well, I've got some gigs, you know, straight away. I got some. I thought, well, gigs. Yeah, I'll do some gigs. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> I'll get and I get paid ten pound for doing it. So right. I thought, what? You know, I can cock a snoot to mum and dad. I'm saying, right, I'm I'm going to earn a living out of this. <laughs> so we went and we we used to do these social clubs, you know, and British Legion clubs, at the, um, three gigs a week with that for about six months, something like that. Right. Okay. And how did it that was, lead then to getting to Ibiza, doing this more session stuff? I did that. That oh, that was quite a lot later, Tom. When I did that, that was when I was I, I was lucky enough to play with the Pretty Things for a while. And it's sad, sad because Phil May, who's the lead singer, just died about two about six weeks ago. It's very sad. Um, but anyway, um, it was a, that was a, that we're jumping about another ten years at least by uh, before. Right, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I went to Ibiza with the Pretty Things, just you know because I, I met people, played with people. And funnily enough, I met Dick Taylor, the guitarist with the Pretty Things. Um, he played in a punk band because when, when, when the punk thing started, I got a bit, um, even though by that time I knew more than three chords, you know, I could play a bit more sophisticated. But, you know, the punk thing was quite exciting. So I got into I got involved with a punk band and we made a record and uh, we had um, Chris Miller, who's better known as Rat Scabies from the Dan playing the drums with that. Right. Although I don't think he'd want to publicise it very much, <laughs> but he played the drums with us on our first record, and um, and then this other guy, this older fella, turned up. His name was Dick Taylor, and he'd played guitar for the Pretty Things since the word go. And he was actually the original bass player, you know, with the Rolling Stones was Dick Taylor, okay. but it was 
it's something we didn't really discuss, you know, because I just he just didn't like to talk about that very much. But it, great man, and I'm still we're still mates, you know. And um, the pretty things needed a a guitar only a depth really just to fill in while their 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 regular guitarist's wife was off having a baby, and he wanted to take time out, and they had gigs in Ibiza. So they asked me to do it, and I did it. And so yeah, you know, it was it was very cool. It was it was a lot of fun. We met some, we accompanied some rather well known people. Um, yeah, yeah, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, Benny King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all two weeks that was. It was all. Awesome. I didn't have a slope of my tea, Tom. But that's all right. It's only a cup of tea. That's okay. Mm. Um, and then you was with Helen Shapiro for a little spell. Good God, Tommy. Yes, I was. <laughs> that was even later still. That was into the late 90s. Um, so that was uh, during the Blues Thrash Therapy album. It was. It was around that time. And Helen, bless her, came to see the Robin Beebe band a couple of times. She was a big fan. She loved it. Um, <laughs> I was quite... Uh, I thought it might have been a bit too loud for her. But she was really... Um, she loved it, did Helen. She was really like, she said, well, great, you know. And it was very nice because if ever I had a gig for her and a Robin Beebe band gig came up, she said, I don't mind if you want to debt my gig. So she, there was another guy who played for Helen Shapiro if I couldn't do it. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So that's that was um, that was fun, you know. But, yeah, it was, Helen was, she was lovely, you know. It was really, it was another experience doing 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 that. I did it for about four years, I suppose. Something like that. And then did that lead on to the Steely Dan thing you was doing? Well, that was... Uh, that was... Um, no, no, no. That was be because of somebody completely different. Some other people who... Um, some other some other professional musicians I used to work with on the function circuit um, who were uh, sort of closet jazz player, closet Steely Dan fans, but we used to just do all these function gigs, you know. And... Um, one of the guys who was a friend of mine, keyboard player, said to me, would you be interested in, in you know, in doing a, a tribute gig to Steely Dan? I said, well, yeah, why not? I mean, it's uh, it's great music. I've always always loved Steely Dan since the early 70s, actually. Although I, I, I lost them a little bit in the late 70s, early 80s when I was a punk rocker because it was just not very cool in those days. Um, uh, but And that's when Steely Dan were not touring anymore. They were doing their... Asia gout show phase. They were towards the end of the first, you know, when they stopped stopped working altogether before they got back together. And the, their music at that time, because they didn't, it was just completely studio and very, very, very polished. And I liked a bit more aggressive stuff in those days because <laughs> uh, I was into the punk stuff. So, but now I've um, I've discovered it. I've discovered it all when I did the tribute band, which was in the early 2000s, and I occasionally still do that, actually, Tom. Um, they've, they replaced me when I was doing... I got too, I got too busy with the Robin Beebe band to be able to do the Steely <laughs> So So I was very nice. In the nicest possible way, I was fired out of that band. Um, but if, the, if either of the guitar players have, have a night off, they still call me up to see if I'm free to do it, if, if they've got a gig, you know. So I still debt for them. So it's it's great and I love it because it's um it's wonderful music to play, absolutely marvelous, you know. And it's just uh, I just love it, you know. I think Donald Fagan and Walter Becker were amazing writers, very clever, lovely, great writers. So yeah. So we we must have first met around that time of your Blues Thrash Therapy album. You know, Tom, I remember vividly when I first met you. <laughs> Let's see if it's the same time then, because uh, well, you first I, in my view. <laughs> Are you going to go first or should I go first? Well, I thought it was the Bull and Bush at Richmond, but I might be wrong. Tom, you're right. I remember it too, mate. I, that's what it was. The, I'm glad you said the Bull and Bush because I couldn't even remember the name of the pub, but it was. Opposite it was the Tube Station. It was right opposite Richmond train station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember going in there and I heard you play and I thought, wow. I, I just thought, wow, this boy can play the blues, which is great because at the time... Most guys your age were like shredders, you know, Satriani or all that. But you played the blues. And I thought, wow, you can play the blues. And I was like blown away by, by well, your we playing. friends then. And then obviously, yeah, yeah. Was, was your jam going before then, the one at South Wimbledon? No, I started my jam up 
I wasn't do- in, in when I met you at the Bull and Bush. It was before I started doing jams, and I started doing jams about a year or two after that. Perhaps um, somebody said to me, "Do you want to do this? Uh, do you fancy? What about doing a jam session? Would you know that that would that would that be good?" And I thought, "Yeah, it'd be good." So I went into the Grove Tavern in South Wimbledon and asked them if they wanted one, and they said, "Yeah, we'll give it a go." And it I was loved that very jam. that was. And you used to, you came to the first one. And you used to come to loads of them, yeah. But that's, that was what... It was every, I think it was, I can't remember if it was monthly or fortnightly. It wasn't weekly, but you came to the whole, or pretty much all of them at the beginning. But it was yeah. such a good crowd in there. And, good and we loved you. We loved you. Everyone there, you, you know, you blew everyone away. Yeah, but I remember Noel. <laughs> yeah, Noel. And I'm still doing jazz with Noel. I'm still... I'm still, once the, you know, I mean, who knows what's going to happen when, eventually when the live music thing gets back going again, I'm hoping that the jam that I do in Carl Scholten will be continuing, um, and Noel still does it with me. Oh, okay, yeah. and obviously Tony Martin, and I think yes. the drums at that time was Hans. It was Hans, yeah, yeah. and Hans, again, he still does the uh, the jam. The, the, man, the like, man of clear thinking, I remember his... his... The Institute for Clear Thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah listen well, I he's he's a one-off the flying dutchman we call him <laughs> so what was the next album then after blue Shreth, uh fresh therapy it was called language of your soul right, and okay. and it was mostly blues brass therapy was mainly cover versions and language of your soul was mainly original stuff okay yeah and then how but, many have you released up to date for the robin bb band oh, sh- Right, about um, under my own name, I think I've done 12 albums, I've done 11 albums, one EP, and one DVD. Okay, and this and people can find this at robinbbband.co.uk. Indeed, you're right, they can. Okay, and um, I I had a look on there, but I couldn't quite work out because with the time I had, which order they went in. That's why I was asking you. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I, I reckon we need to rejig that. If it's not in the right order, I think we probably should put them in chronological order there, Tom. That's something that I need to probably do, I expect. So what's the most up-to-date one for people? Well, the latest album that I've done was a live album that I did with Alan Glenn. Right. It's called Blues. And uh, it was recorded in a church in Caterham, which is St. Lawrence Church. And... The a couple of people were putting on uh, a couple of promoters were putting on monthly acoustic gigs in there because it, it, it because it's still a consecrated church, but they only have services. I think they have services about two three services a year. It's a very ancient church. It, it was built in the 11th century, um, and it's a beautiful place to uh, to play, okay. but you, you, only an acoustic gig. So I did a, a duo with Alan Glenn, you know, the harmonica player. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it, it was good. It's uh, it's really, really, really good. That's the latest thing. That was last year. Um, what about the band-wise? The, the latest, well, the last studio album we did with the band was called No More A Secret. That's been out about three years now. So um, is that what you was playing at um, Matt's Festival, at, um, the old Bush? It, oh, yeah, the old you had Bush. the horns, didn't you? The Robin Beebe Big Band. And we had the three-piece, yeah, and this was... This is where I've been frustrated by the um, the lockdown because I had some gigs, quite a lot of gigs in the book for that big band. Mm-hmm. And they've all been cancelled, of course, you know. Yeah. It's a shame that we were going to be doing quite a lot of festivals. We were going to do the Cone Festival. We had a festival for Monica, you know, Boogaloo Promotions. We had a few festivals in the book. We had, we had one at Scarborough. That was the first one to get cancelled, actually, because that was due to be on uh, on the weekend of the lockdown. And the guy was... The guy very sadly rang me up to cancel it only a week before. So, you know, I had quite a few um, big band gigs in the book. And, yeah, as you answer to your question, um, yeah, it's mainly the material of uh, No More Secret. We'd we'd, we'd done Horner, well, the the, the, the trumpet player, whose name's Jack Birchwood, had done some really, really great horn arrangements, you know, for for about, um, about a dozen songs, enough for a set, you know, so... We're going to work on doing getting getting more horn arrangements as well. Yeah, it sounded so that, big. That was, my, that was my way forward, actually, Tom. That was. Yeah. Well, it's good. It Sorry. sounded big because I was out, out in the sitting out the front. It was a big sound. Did you hear? Yeah, yeah, I was there. It was huge, yeah. mate. It was, yeah, I know you were there. I remember. 
did we? I, don't, I can't remember if I saw you that day. That was such that day because it was my first ever Big Bang gig. Um, I was like, after we'd done it, I was like floating around. On, I was on a high. I was honestly on a high because I was quite nervous about doing this gig, you know, and that, that it would go okay with the horns. And it went so well. I was just like, you know, I was I was off on a high for a few days after that. It really was. So, what's your method to songwriting? Oh, Tom, I, I, there's no method. It's, sometimes it's a it's a it's a it's a lyric. Sometimes it's a, it's a riff. You know, some you know you know what it's like, mate. You're a songwriter. You're a great songwriter. I mean, you know what it's like. I could ask you the same question, and I think my I think our answers would probably be similar. Mm. You know, in that sometimes. I just have a, 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 a um, I sometimes sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and there's something in my head and I have to get up and write it down. Right. I haven't happened much recently, I must admit, but there have been a few occasions where that's happened. You know, um, it could be anything. It just could be anything, couldn't it? It could be you, you, you pick up a guitar, you start doodling around, and you get a little riff. Mm -hmm. You think I must remember that, so you have to record it. If you don't rem if you don't record it, you you'll forget it. You'll never get it back. You know, because mm. these things. Are on the spur of the moment. So, what's the best song you've written? Oh, Tommy, I don't know. Good God, I I, I can't you must say. Must have a favourite. Yeah, I do. I, I've got some songs that I do. Probably "No More a Secrets" quite a good one. Um, a lot of people like that. And then I've got a couple of minor key blues that people like. One's called "Under Your Spell." Yeah, what one's... do you like? Oh, I do. Tommy, I mate, it's a difficult one. I quite like "No More a Secret" because it's a happy. It's a happy, positive, nice. Is there jolly. one that you do where you think, "Yeah, this is great to solo on," and I, I know it builds and it's. Uh, there's one called uh, "Fast Lanes Busy," which is like that. There's another one "Too Deep," that's like that. Um, What's the one with the um the, the blue scale riff? Da 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 da. Oh, it... Little Annie Brown. <laughs> right, okay, I mean, I always remember that when you do it. Yeah. Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah, that was a, that was one. I wrote that school uh, uh, school. Sorry, I wrote that. So that's a that's a Freudian slip. I wrote that song when I was teaching at, at school and I had no student turn up. And the student that was meant to turn up was called Annie Brown. This sounds a bit bad, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I started writing so my um, one of my buddy, one of my teacher colleagues i went to the, the the staff room and i said oh annie brown hasn't turned up for a lesson and somebody said annie brown it sounds like she sounds like a cowgirl with a name like that hey annie brown you know again <laughs> annie get your gun and i, I just sort of thought oh well, i've got nothing else to do for half an hour so i just went back to my practice room and i wrote a song i started anyway and that's and then i just worked on it and it came out you know and then we recorded that on the album um We've recorded that on the album Fast Life Songs, which was a which is a solo album I did, a sort of acoustic. It's the first unplugged album I did, but then we did a rocked out version of it on a live album called um, Switch On The Live. Yeah. And I've never recorded that with the band in the studio, that song. It's a cool riff. Thank you. Um, and it's one that I remember, obviously still now, I remember, because it goes off a bit with the band at the same time, doesn't it? You sort of sing a bit. It, and then does. It... it does. We have a lot We have a lot of fun with that song. And I mean, with the band, I mean, it, we're just trying to have fun with everything, really, you know. <laughs> well, is that your aim with gigging? Is it come more for the public, like a show, entertainment? Because... Yes and no. Because obviously I know all your, you know, with the walking out into the street with your guitar and. Yeah. Yes, it is. I think it's, I think entertaining. I think we are, despite the fact that we are musicians, we're also entertainers. We're, we're there to sort of entertain the public. And so I quite like to do stuff that's a bit crazy because people think it's, fun. people love it, you know. Mm. I quite like it myself. If I saw somebody doing that, it would, it would, it, I'd like it. I'd enjoy it, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, entertainment is important, I think. Um, but you don't compromise your music or anything like that. You know, it's all about the music comes first, comes before anything is the music and the musicianship comes first. It totally comes first and playing it with, with heart and soul. That's, mm. that's what comes first. And then the entertainment's another side. It's, it's the, that's the icing on the cake. And have you always had that or is that something that's come uh, no, I didn't always have that, mate. Um, I tell you what, I, I first, okay, another thing I did years and years ago, um, 
was I was in another tribute band, um, uh, the Bogus Blues Brothers, okay. and that, that's what got the entertainment thing going. That's that started the table dancing and all that, you know, because um, I was uh, I used to play the guitar still, but I were I, you know I used to dress as a blues brother and we used to do the whole Blues Brothers show. I remember it now. You say, yeah, and it was fun, you know, and that's what started me doing the table dancing. I just thought it would be quite fun. Yeah, it, it just happened spontaneously when we first. <laughs> I, 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 we used to play Peter Gunn, da, 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 da. and uh, there was a guitar solo that I used to do on Peter Gunn. And one day, I just thought it'd be funny if I played this on a table. So I just left the stage and jumped on a table. I had a long cable. Luckily, I didn't. Luckily, I didn't pull the cable out. That's before I started using, um, you know, wireless systems. Yeah. So have you had any accidents with with anything? Yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah, I fell off a table. <laughs> oh, when was that? I fell off a t That was when I, I've never... It's never happened with the Robin Beebe band. Right, I look, okay. only ever happened once, and I really hurt myself, Tom. It was really bad. I had a bruise for about two weeks. I, I, I fell off one of those tables. It, we were doing a pub, and um, I was doing the Blues Brothers, and I, I jumped on this table. It only had one leg in the middle. <laughs> it was really high... <laughs> <laughs> it was a really tall table. It was like it was one of those that you stand against, you know, and you lean up, you know. It was, it was. It was. I thought I'd get on that. I just. I took a flying leap. I was a bit fitter in those days than I am now. I just took a flying leap, landed on the. I just got on the table, but unfortunately, the table just went straight away. Boom. So I went as well, and the guitar went one way. I went the other way, and the music carried on because. The, it was only a duo, and the, the backing track, it was a backing track with a sequence. So it just... <laughs> oh, dear. And my, oh, dear. my partner came and picked me up, and I got the guitar back on and carried on. Blimey. <laughs> True showman, styled it out. Professional style, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I bruised on my leg for about the next two weeks. <laughs> What's your Desert Island disc? Very good one, Tom. Um, I think it might be the first song that came into mind then, you know, was A Day in the Life by the Beatles. OK, so you Beatles uh, or Stones fan? Uh, Beatles. Beatles when I was a kid and still. But uh, Stones took me a little bit. I'd been more, more mature to get into the Stones because I wasn't when I was a kid, I wasn't really into the blues very much. I didn't quite get the whole that whole rhythm and blues thing until later until i was about 14 or 15, until i started to play the guitar then i got it you know so and i i saw this i've seen the stones a few times you know uh, i saw them um two years ago actually they were amazing one of the best concerts i've ever seen in my life 28 wickenham ah oh, when what year was that 2018 two oh, years 2018, ago okay because they played mm. there in uh about 10 years before that didn't they at twickenham rugby stadium they they did. I didn't go. This was the only time I've seen them. Uh, I, when I was very young, um, I managed to bunk out and see them at Hyde Park. You oh, know, okay. the one that was videoed. Yeah, I was there. I was there. Um, but my mum said I've got to be back home by eight o'clock, you know, because I, I was very young. And yeah, that was after Brian Jones had died. And they, they really the uh, the uh, but we couldn't see a thing because um, where we sat, we couldn't see the stage. Um, so we had to walk around. We we like walked around, walked around. We got to the back of the stage. We couldn't really see the front of the stage though. Um, but we heard the music. It was lovely. It was, was great. Was it just yeah. that gig, or was it a an, a, like a, a festival? No, it was, or... it was a festival. It was. I think it was the first time that King Crimson ever played. So the only other band I remember was King Crimson, and there was a strange hippie band called the Third Ear Band, um, and then, oh, there was a band called the Edgar Broughton Band as well. And, and then there was the Stones, and the Stones were very attitude, apparently. Um, I think I remember seeing a video of it, and Keith, Keith and Mick Taylor, who just joined it, they 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 had big trouble with tuning that day. But you know, they played, they played, they just released Honky Tonk Woman, so they played that. Yeah, it was. It was I mean, I it was a long time ago, and I can't remember much, but it was just very exciting to be allowed to go on my own to a concert without my mum and dad. <laughs> So what books are you reading at the moment? Hey, What books are you reading at the moment? I'm reading a book. It's an interesting question. I'm reading a book called... It's, it's all about... You know, I can't remember the name of it. It's it's a travel guide. It's 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 all about a guy who... who he, he wrote... Um, 
a book about his travels in various different parts of England and various different um, country. No, no, no. The book's upstairs. I won't go. I just can't remember. I think it's called uh, The Road or The Way, The Old Ways. This bloke along these old paths that have been there for centuries. And it's quite interesting. Oh, OK. It's, it's better. I usually read about half a page and then fall asleep, actually. Where would you like to go more than any other place in the world? Probably back. OK, New Orleans again, I think. I want to go there now, but I, I, mm, OK. Yeah, New Orleans. I'd, I'd like to go to New Orleans or I'd like to probably go to Jerusalem. Uh, the, the reason for those, if you're interested, um, is New Orleans was the very first time I went to America was to New Orleans. And we went to um, I went to, I went there to do a gig. We stayed for three days and uh, I've never seen anything like the music there just blew me away. Absolutely blew me. Away. We didn't we only went to bars. We, we were staying in a hotel called the Royal Sinesta Hotel, which was in Bourbon Street. And uh, when we got there. We walked up and down Bourbon Street, going in the bars, seeing all the bands, and it was just unbelievable. And what the, the vibes were just amazing. It was like the place was alive with music. There was music on the street corners. There was music in the bars. It was actually the tail end of, it was late April, and it was the tail end of the jazz festival, actually, because they have a jazz festival, a monthly jazz festival. And it was amazing. And there was music in the... There was in the record shops, CD, in the CD shops, you know. This was in the late 90s I went there. Um, and it was it was astounding. Honestly, it was astounding. And I remember seeing a band. Uh, they, were, they were playing all brass instruments, but they were playing like rap music, hip hop music, like jungle music on all these, all these tubers and euphoniums and things. It was just unbelievable. And in Jerusalem, I'd like to go there because my dad was from Palestine. Um, he came from Jaffa and um, I went to, I went there for the first time uh, three years ago and I'd just like to go back because it's an awesome place, you know, although not the happiest of places at the moment and I don't think there's a chance of going there right now. But do you have I'm any family still out there? I do, I, no, not actually there, not in Israel, not in the country Israel, no. But, uh, well, you know, the thing is my family's very, very, um, it's very big and very drawn, very... That there may be a couple of very distant cousins who live there, but I don't know who they are. Um, most of the family now live in in all over the world, all over the world. That on my father's side, um, they all live. Some quite a few of them live in London. Some of them live in the Middle East. Some of them live in Egypt. Some of them live in Saudi Arabia. Some of them live in America, Canada, uh, all over the. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? Uh, the best piece of advice that I've been given is to follow your heart. Okay. okay. And I don't even know who gave me that. I gave it to myself. And if you yeah. could go back in time to relive one historical day, what day would it be? Uh, I would probably relive, um, uh, ooh, I wouldn't, I couldn't say exactly what day it would be. I, I would like to relive the day that the B record please please me went to number one in the charts which was probably not early 1963 probably february something like that and i'd quite like to relive that day i was around but i can't remember you know we'll jump onto some of the guitar stuff quickly um so you give lessons do you do yeah. you, you've been doing it online now so people Since the, would, yes how do they get hold of you again through the website uh at the moment um they yeah they have to yeah Website. Yeah, that's right. I have got a, a, a tuition advert there on the website. I mean, all, all the students that I've got now are actually students that I used to teach face to face in schools. Not all of them, actually. That's not true. Um, I would say 80 percent of them are ones that are face to face in schools. And then I've got a few students that used to come to my house who are having lessons online. And there are one or two that might want to start coming back to the house if they're allowed to, which I think they will be allowed to soon. So, yeah, you know, but I, mean, I quite like the online teaching. The only problem, obviously, is if you don't have a good connection, if the Wi-Fi is a bit crap. Is it um, mostly 30 minute lessons? Yes. Yeah. OK. Mostly. Mostly. I do. Well, you do do the hour as well. 
yeah, for people, it, you know, for, for most of the young, young the sort of school kids, it's 30 minutes. And the grown-ups, if they want an hour, they've got an hour. What's your two pedals you could not gig without? Delay pedal? Uh, tube screamer. No, I do gig without pedals, actually, but very rarely. Um, I can gig without pedals. No, but if you go into like a jam or going somewhere where you're going to grab two pedals, what would they be? Oh, probably, I probably only just use, I probably use my old Boss B5 be the one because that's that's a multi multi effects it's, it's got four it's got it's got it's got a chorus which i don't use hardly ever a, dig, a digital delay it's got a compressor and it's got a an overdrive in it but it's very i mean they've they stopped making those about 30 years ago now right okay they were super you've used it you've used my b5 probably at one of your jams you've probably yeah. had it set up yeah i remember Love you it. had a reverb pedal or something on one of the fender amps I do have a reverb pedal. Um, I've got a Boss reverb pedal now, um, even though the Fender amp's got its reverb in it, you know. Sometimes that packs up the reverb, actually. Um, but um, so I've got a reverb. I've got a digital reverb, Boss digital reverb. I used to have uh, a digital reverb that was like an Alesis one, but it, it, it died. So I've now got a Boss one, which is like a Boss foot pedal type thing. Your but wireless stuff, what do you use for that? Do you have the same one each time? Samson, yeah, yeah. I, I, I only use the same one. I've got two different... I've got two I've got two of the same, basically. So if one breaks, I've got another one. So, yeah. um, it's made by a company called Samson. Uh, it's a guitar, Samson something or other, guitar system. It's got a little bug, bug that you plug into the... Uh, to the to the electric guitar. Some people say that it ch changes the sound, but in fact, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really change the electric guitar sound at all. You can still get a nice, clean sound out of it. Some people say, no, I don't like that because it, 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 it muddies the sound up a little bit. Well, I don't think it does, but I wouldn't use it for an acoustic. Um, I did try using it for acoustic, and I noticed that with the acoustic pickup, it did slightly muddy the sound. But it won't muddy an ordinary uh, single-coil Stratocaster sound at all. Uh, yeah. Is there any new skills on the guitar you're working on at the moment? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm just trying to see the fretboard actually. It was a new skill because my eyesight's going. Um, no, um, new skills. Um, yeah, all the time, all the time. I'm trying to. Do you know? I'm trying to. What I'm trying to do now is work on using just altered chords uh, rather than these are look more like musical ideas really. Just using strange chords for... Substitution chords, you mean? Or? Yeah, substitution chords, yeah. Very interesting substitution chords. I'm not very good at it. This sort of... Um, I've forgotten... You know, I've forgotten all my theory. I haven't... I never had any theory anyway, Tom. But sometimes when I have... When I do lessons, the students come in and they tell me a load of theory. And I say, what was that again? <laughs> they end up teaching me stuff, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there is a, a, a jazz theory thing where you can play everything deliberately out of key. And um, I'm actually quite interested in that, that sort of thing. I and mean, there's some there's some really interesting new bands that are grabbing my attention as well, and new guitar players playing mainly um, jazz and neo-soul stuff, which is, I find really interesting, you know. Do you do any finger warm-ups on the guitar? No, should do, but... I, yeah, I do, I do, but not before a gig. I've got some little exercises. I've got some exercises that I teach my students. And I do them myself, yeah. So I do have finger warm-ups, yeah, actually. Um, I learned some many, many years ago um, from a book called Mickey Baker, How to Play Jazz and Hot Guitar, book one. I think I've got that somewhere. That's a great book. You've got to read music, though, because it's all in... It's not yeah, in. I never read it. <laughs> well, I tried, to figure out, I tried to figure out what all that meant. It took me a long time. Um, so I'm not... I'm going to do... I can actually read music now, but I'm not very fast, you know. I'm not... When I was playing with Helen Shapiro, doing all those function bands, all the other musicians could read music like, you know, like fly stuff, as, the, as we say. Um, but, I, but I couldn't, you know, so I had to try to make myself a bit better. So I, I actually practiced it for a while, but it's still I'm still slow. You know, depends what depends what key it depends if you've got sharps and flats and stuff in the key signature. Right. OK. And do you use any arpeggios? Yeah, I like arpeggios. Yeah, I, I really do. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, I also like the sort of, um, you know, the sort of lead rhythm, uh, the, I, I like comping as well in, inside court, like, 
the, the most famous example of that is L Little Wing introduction, you know, that sort of thing, you know, where where you play, you, you take the chords, you break them up, you play little fills within within the chords. You know, I really, really, really like all that stuff. And it's like all the soul guitar players do, you know, Steve Cropper used to do that. Um, the country guitar players do that, you know. Um, um, obviously Hendrix did it, and Steve, Ray, all those people do it, you know. And, and, and the American guys all play, all play that sort of stuff, you know. Love it. It's good. <laughs> It's all good. Right, so I'll ask you some quick five questions. Yeah. Superman or Batman? Batman. Comedy or horror? Comedy. Tex or cool? Cool. Cookies or cake? Cake. Do you think opposites truly attract? No. Do you think chemistry is instant or grows with time? Both. Impulsive or methodical? Impulsive. Reverb, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> you answered the Stones and the Beatles one, so I won't do that one. All right. And who's playing in your CD player today in the car? Uh, I haven't been in the car. There isn't a CD, I'm afraid. I, 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 what I'm doing, what I do, I... Okay, so yeah, uh, YouTube. I'm listening to um, Hiatus Coyote. Okay. Or Tom Mish. Okay. And what you got for dinner tonight? I don't know yet. I'll probably a jacket potato. Jacket potato. Jacket potato and baked beans, mate, and a packet of salad from Tesco's. <laughs> Just to keep it healthy, you know. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Thank you for your time. It's my pleasure, man. <laughs> Do you want to give us a little play out on your guitar? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Hang on. Just give me a second. <laughs> See you soon. Thumbs up. You take care, mate. Thank you very much for having me. Hats off, Tom. Hats off. Pleasure, sir. See you soon. <laughs> hey, it's Tommy Allen from TommyAllenMusic.com. That was Robin BB. You can find out more about him and his music at www.RobinBBBand.co.uk. So go check him out. Next week, we have Alan White, the photographer, and also runs the Early Blues website. So we catch up with him at home and find out what he's been up to. So please give us a like, hit the subscribe button because they are important to us and we're going to have a word from our director and see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>